Welcome. My name is Rachel Johnson. I'm an educator with the public programs team here at Crystal Bridges, and I'm happy to welcome you to this morning's program about Thomas Hart Benton and the Buffalo River. Presented in partnership with University of Arkansas Humanities Center, this conversation will be centered on the Buffalo River, the 50th anniversary of its becoming a national river, and the spectacular works by Benton that captured its beauty. Following this discussion, we'll present a screening of the film First River, How Arkansas Saved a National Treasure, showing the river's history from the 1960s to today. Please join me in welcoming Tricia Starks, director, University of Arkansas Humanities Center. Hello, thank you so much for being here. Welcome everyone. I, I can't think of a more amazing space to talk about the reflections of the river through the eyes of artists than this beautiful place that brings together art and nature. I wanna thank Austin Bailey, curator of the Crystal Bridges for allowing our team to be here and as well the team here at Crystal Bridges, Rachel Johnson, Lauren Stevens, Adriana Garner and Megan Banta. Thank you for allowing us to meet here. I want to thank the U of A Press for bringing their books here, for the Ozark Society for partnering with us as part of this event. As um, noted, I'm Trish Starks, director of the University of Arkansas Humanities Center, and along with my co-leader, Joshua Youngblood there in the back of University of Arkansas Library Special Collections. We are putting together a year-long celebration of the Buffalo's 50th year as a national river. It's part of an entire program that we are calling the Digital Buffalo. Today's program on artistry, imagery, film, and activism is but one of our explorations of the long story, the centuries, millennia even, of human connection to the Buffalo River. On October 20th, we'll have another event, part of the Digital Buffalo. We will be meeting at the Pryor Center to discuss the next 50 years of the Buffalo with geoscientists and climate specialists. If you enjoy today's, I hope that you will meet us there. We are also pleased to have White River Media with us in the back. They are live streaming today's event. They have also recorded our previous event at Gilbert that was Buffalo, Mu Buffalo River in Music. If you like today's event, check out the stream of either today or of last week's event in Gilbert. It's a great, um, look at bluegrass and um, songs about the river from today as well as the past from Still on the Hill and Bill and Aviva Pilgrim. Um, we have also available on our website the digitalbuffalo.uark.edu. You can see a picture of it back there on our table. We have archival materials, original documents and reports, interviews and resources, lectures and interpretive passages, maps, surveys. New material is being added every day and will be ha added on throughout the next year and a half as part of our funding. This is all funded by a University of Arkansas Chancellor's Fund Innovation Grant that is allowing us to bring this special programming. Today's programming, though. I am so excited for today's event, not just as a resident of XNA, but also as a Kansas Cityan and a Thomas Hart Benton enthusiast. I have spent so many days at the Nelson Atkins staring at his Persephone and the, the, the plasticine beauty of his landscapes and to see these now translated into the area that I so much love is just very exciting for me. As part of our hour-long panel, we are going to have experts with their eyes on artists who have looked at the river. First, Thomas Hart Benton, and then the photography of Ken Smith. While we don't have Thomas Hart Benton with us, we do have a cutout of him in the back, and that is his, indeed his size. He's 5'2", so I feel, I feel positively tall. We are very pleased to have in the audience Ken Smith. So if you have... If you have, as I have, enjoyed the beauty of his photography and are thankful for his activism in saving the river, I hope that you will go up to him after our programming and thank him in person. Um, but for today, I want to talk about our two experts. I'm going to introduce first Steve Sitton. 
He is the current and only the second administrator of the Thomas Hart Benton Home and Studio State Historic Site in Kansas City. Mr. Sitton has been at the Benton Home since July of 2001 and has worked for Missouri State Parks since October of 1994. Steve is a graduate of Ruskin High School in South Kansas City, class of 85. He earned his bachelor's degree in history from Drury College in Springfield in 1990. He was initially hired as a tourist assistant at the Deutschheim, Deutschheim. Deutschheim. Russianists should never pronounce German, um, the Deutschheim State Historic Site in Herman, Missouri, and then he became uh, the site administrator there after six years. As director of the Benton Home, he has the responsibility and honor of actually living in this historic house. He is single with a cat, but no children. He spends his free time reading, playing poker, and is a member of a weekly trivia team. Please join me in welcoming Steve and thanking him for coming to us and sharing his expertise. Thank you. You guys hear me okay back there? All right. I'm used to talking to groups of fourth graders, so I've learned to project pretty good. And, um, so I do work for Missouri State Parks uh, at the Thomas Hart Benton Home. Uh, they let me come across state line this morning, though, so, uh, but I'll head back uh, after this. Uh, but uh, I'm going to talk about Thomas Hart Benton, um, arguably one of the artists that really helped make the, national, or the, the Buffalo River a, a nationally known river, a destination, a tourism point, um, due to his paintings uh, of the, the Buffalo and, and other Ozark rivers. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit today, this morning, about how his background, his upbringing, his love of the Ozarks really influenced uh, his artwork. And if you're not sure who Thomas Hart Benton is, when we start looking at some of these paintings, you'll probably go, oh, that guy. I've seen his stuff. Almost every art museum in the country has got something by Benton. Crystal Bridges has got several wonderful pieces, so you might want to go take a look at some of those uh, this afternoon as well. So. But here he is at three years old. Tom is from the Ozarks. He's born just up the road in the small town of Neosho, Missouri, born April 15, 1889. Uh, got a map of where Neosho is, uh, but you guys should all be pretty familiar with that. Um, Tom also was an excellent writer. He uh, wrote two autobiographies, and right on page one of his uh, 1937 autobiography, An Artist in America, he says, Neosho is an isolated town set in a series of rolling hills on the edge of the Ozarks. It was a pretty town with a hard clay, rock, and sand foundation encircling by creeks and running springs. So again, right on page one, he's already talking about the Ozarks. Uh, he comes uh, from a long line of lawyers and politicians. Uh, this is his father. How's this for a name? Messenius Eason Benton. Uh, he goes by Colonel Benton. Uh, he was a uh, lawyer up in Newton County, Missouri. He was a U.S. District Attorney. And when Tom was seven, his father was elected to the House of Representatives. So the family actually moves to D.C. for eight years. Uh, and then they come back to Neosho every summer. So Tom actually gets to grow up in both places. And I do think that serves him well later on as an adult. He is able to move in both worlds. Um, live in New York City, actually, as an artist for quite a while, but then come back to rural uh, Midwest and meet these people uh, and paint these, these sorts of folks and scenes. And Tom also uh, writes about going with his father out to these Ozark rivers. Uh, my father, with a crony or two, would abandon his law practice and head for flowing waters. After I was big enough, he would often take me with him. Uh, it was on one of these trips when I was seven years old that I experienced the ecstasy of discovering I could swim. So here's a little sketch that Tom did of, of just such a scene, a couple boys in a swimming hole. Again, back to the autobiography and artists in America, I learned to le know the lure of running water and the immense sense of freedom given to those who yield to it. So his father passes away in 1924. Uh, he actually was fairly disappointed in Tom. Uh, he wanted Tommy to become a lawyer, to become a politician, uh, not an artist. Uh, he considered young Tom to be la lazy and a dreamer. And No son of mine will be an artist. It's not manly. But when his father passes away, Tom begins to come back to 
rural America. He'd been living in New York City for about a dozen years, but he begins to come back to the Midwest, back to the Ozarks, going to the Deep South, um, and, one of, and he's doing these sketches, and he starts painting or sketching the rivers, starting out more with the bigger rivers, such as uh, this cotton boat, the Tennessee Bell, that was the last cotton boat on the, the uh, Mississippi River. And in his autobiography, it's about the different parts of the country. So the chapters are the South, the Midwest, the West, the cities, the mountains, and the rivers. And he says, there is something about flowing water that makes for easy views. Down the river is freedom from consequence. All one has to do is jump in a skiff at night and by the morrow be beyond the reach of trouble. And Tom really is a good writer. Um, he really can turn a phrase. A, a recent critic said that Benton missed his calling. He should have been a writer. But there is a scene pretty much just like what he described, Moonlight on the Osage from 1938. Uh, this is the Buffalo River Canoeing Guide from 1973. Uh, there is Tom on the cover, and this is the one that was sent to his house. Uh, this is actually in, in the Benton Home Collection up in Kansas City. He floated most of the Ozark rivers, but the buffalo and the current were his two favorites. And almost every year, uh, sometimes twice a year, he would come down to this part of the country and, and, and take a float trip. And, of course, brought his sketchbook along. This, uh, some of you were, uh, maybe if you were paying attention uh, when we just had these random slides running uh, as you were gathering, and there was one of Tom and his swim tunks and a, another boy stand beside, that and who you have with your back to us, that is his son, T.P. Uh, T.P. became a professional classical flute player, and he died 12 years ago at the age of 83. This is a John Boat on the Buffalo River, 1967, uh, and there you can see how Tom, he has exaggerated it, but you can certainly tell what uh, feature there, what landmark he is painting. Uh, and then later on in uh, Saturday Evening Post interview, he said, women say they're dying to get a look at the Darling Wilderness, and the next thing you know, they're demanding flush toilets. <laughs> But for those of you that weren't sure who Tom Benton was, then you start seeing these paintings, and you go, yep, yep, that looks familiar. But he always took his sketch pad with him, so he could do these sorts of quick drawings um, that are quite good, I think, um, but just a few simple lines. And of course, he brought his pipe and a jug of bourbon. This is a, a really lovely Benton painting, Cave Spring from 1963. Uh, that is his lawyer, Lyman Field, taking a nap on the bank. And Tom said, and this applies to Arkansas, of course, too, but the rivers of Missouri are often very beautiful. Many of them have their sources in immense hill springs, which pour out of the limestone bluffs at the rate of thousands of gallons a minute. The water runs cold and clear for a while. And again, think about, look at these sorts of descriptions he's doing. Great sycamores hang over their banks, and in the summer when the current moves slowly, these are duplicated in the river below. On one side or another of the rivers, outcropping white bluffs hang and break the monotony of tree branch and foliage. So this is something he writes in 1937, and then, look, you've got those outcropping white bluffs, the sycamore trees hanging above, uh, the reflections in the water uh, that he does in 1963. Tom does tend to exaggerate. He makes these very curvy, flowy sorts of lines. Uh, he doesn't use a lot of straight lines and hard edges. Um, in fact, he said you can't show action with a straight line. And even though this is a very peaceful, uh, serene sort of scene, uh, there is definitely this almost sense of movement, too. And then also he says, to get in a skiff and row out in the middle of one of these rivers on a summer night when the moon is full is to find all the spirit of Spencer and his fairy lands forlorn. Benton actually makes a mistake here. Uh, he's talking about uh, Edmund Spencer, uh, uh, English writer, but what, who he quotes is uh, Ode to a Nightingale, a completely different author. Um, so he just mess that one up. But he's talking about the, the, the big summer moon and the, the somber shadows. And then again, creates just sorts of scene in an illustration he did uh, for Huck Finn. Uh, Benton illustrated 
uh, an edition of Huck Finn in 1942. And boy, Tom Benton and Mark Twain, that just fits, doesn't it? But Benton uh, illustrated four, 13 books. Uh, four of them talk about the, the rivers, again, the big rivers. So he also did an edition of Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, who we mentioned, Life on the Mississippi um, in watercolor, and then a book you've never heard of probably called Three Rivers South. It's a young adult reader uh, book about uh, the life of young Abe Lincoln, where Lincoln takes a flatboat um, down the Mississippi River to sell lumber. Also, one of the great Ozark folklorists, uh, Vance Randolph, uh, he did all sorts of books. One of his four-volume books was called Ozark Folk, Folk Songs, and Benton did the end papers, uh, so this high view looking down. And Benton uh, contributed a story to another Vance Randolph book, uh, an Ozark anthology. And I'll let you read this for just a second. But again, think of how Tom is able to in his words, create almost this visual image for you. And vice versa, in his paintings, I think he very much is a storyteller as well. Of course, Ozark music, and I know you guys talked about this uh, last time, uh, he really liked Ozark music. Uh, for those of you that were paying attention, the music that you heard as you were gathering this morning, that actually is from Tom Benton's album, uh, Saturday night at Tom Benton's, he was an accomplished harmonica player. So he's out in the backwoods, he's hearing these folk tunes, he begins to uh, write them down, transcribe them, but he also does a lot of drawings of these Ozark musicians. So this is the Leverett brothers from Galena, Missouri that he sketched in 1931. And then he put them in this painting, not one of my favorites, uh, but uh, it, does, it did draw a pretty good price for him. This is Lord Heal the Child, so it's a, a revival meeting. The arts of our pioneers were simple arts, perhaps, but they were genuine and they were assiduously cultivated. In the back ways of our country, many of them have survived up to this day, and in little churches hidden away in the depths of our mountains, it is possible sometimes to hear music that is, though simple, just as genuinely music as any that may be heard in the churches of the great cities. So again, the, the Tom Benton likes bluegrass folk music. shouldn't come as a huge surprise. He also did like uh, classical music, opera, symphonies, chamber music as well. But he said it's an old-time religion that people of the interior hills are attracted to. They allow no stringed instruments in their churches and do not confuse God's song with the devil. So then uh, the one on your left, uh, Dudley Vance, that is a sketch he did back in the 30s. Then later on in the 1970s, late 1970s, he comes back to the Ozarks down to Branson and does some new sketches of some of the old-time musicians. This guy, uh, Chick Allen, uh, just a wonderful uh, sort of idea. Uh, his instrument of choice, he played a full jawbone of a mule tied on a string around his neck, and he would hit it with a stick or a pencil or something as a, as a percussion instrument. So there's uh, Chick uh, being sketched by Tom. And there he is, you can see in the center. There's the full jawbone that he's got, and there he is sitting on a little barrel in a general store. The reason Tom had gone back to uh, these Ozark musicians in the late 19, or the mid 1970s, in 1973, 74, he was commissioned to paint a mural for the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville, uh, titled "Sources of Country Music," and he includes Chick Allen in this painting, although he gave him a fiddle here and here. But notice, he paints these fiddlers. He doesn't paint, paint the classic uh, symphony violin players up here. He's got them holding the fiddle down in the crook of their elbow. But let's get back into the rivers. Those who know him, Benton, know Benton best, say he is happiest when floating downstream with a sketch pad, a chaw of tobacco in his mouth, and at the close of the day, a supper of fried fish, baked beans, and fresh buttered radishes, accompanied by good conversation and nip of Jack Daniels. Um, and then Tom talks about, in his autobiography, again, uh, the float trips, uh, the, all these uh, guides, and the, you know, the, uh, we can rent these canoes and things, and, uh, but a lot of whiskey and beer is taken along to make the fish bite. They camp at night on the sandbars. 
so there is just such a fisherman's camp. Looks like a couple bottles there, a little skinny dipping, um, but it's just the guys. But I mentioned that Benton really likes to float the buffalo. Um, depending on how long of a trip they were taking, um, they would start usually at one of these three spots and then float down to uh, either you know, one of these three. Um, so you guys said you were just at Gilbert. That was one of his takeout points um, in many cases. So uh, this is a painting of his from 1970 titled The Shoot. Um, and then uh, on the side is his sketch of it where he has gridded it off so that he can blow it up to the final painting. Notice something else that Tom changes between the, the sketch and the painting. In the sketch, he's got a couple canoes already gone through this series of rapids, but in the painting, he took them out, so the canoe you see is the one that's leading the way. And when we show the movie here in a little bit, you will see him going through this same portion of the Buffalo River. So the movie we're going to show in a moment uh, is from 1971. This is when things were happening. There was some talk about saving the Buffalo River. There had been some talk, you know, that maybe the, uh, that the Corps of Engineers was going to put some dams on the Buffalo River, and Tom didn't want that to happen, so he got involved in the movement to save the Buffalo River. And he got together with the EPA and did this movie, uh, A Man in a River. He's 82 years old in this footage that you're going to see here in a moment. Uh, he was a, a pretty tough old bird. Oops. Sorry, if I keep flashing somebody there with the, the uh, laser pointer, I'm sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. So, um, His good friend, one of his neighbors, uh, Randall Jesse, he was a news director up in Kansas City. Uh, some of you may have heard that name. Uh, he went along. You'll see him in the, the film as well. So uh, they used Hedges canoes. That's Harold Hedges there in the back. Uh, it had been a pretty wet spring, the river was run, running pretty high, but Tom and, and Harold's canoe was the only one that didn't tip over that year. A couple years later, now he's 84. He's had a couple heart attacks. His doctor says you shouldn't go. Uh, you need to take it easy. We don't want you to be more than an hour away from the hospital. Uh, <laughs> so, there they are with their bag of butternut bread eating lunch on an overturned canoe. So uh, one of his few autumn sorts of paintings, Ozark Reflections from 1961, but on that uh, trip, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch went along and said, is this your last float trip? And Tom said, how the hell do I know? I figure I've got several good years left of me yet, but I do know I like to paint big pictures and I like to take float trips. Um, I mentioned that Sources of Country Music uh, mural that he did. Uh, January 19, 1975, Tom went out to his studio in Kansas City. He was going to put his signature on the mural. He had his massive heart attack and dropped it. In his studio with a brush in his hand, the mural was unsigned, but essentially it's done, and it is in Nashville. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful small mural. but uh, And then again, back to Saturday Evening Post, uh, they say that in everything from canoe to LST of World War II landing craft, uh, Tom has floated or paddled or steamed on a river and creek and bayou across the land. So um, I'm going to sit down and we'll get this movie going. It's about 15 minutes. This is a love story, the love of a fascinating free-flowing stream by a great American painter 
author, conservationist, raconteur, Thomas Hart Benton. Born in Neosho, Missouri on April 15, 1889, he was named after his granduncle, Senator Thomas Hart Benton, Missouri's first United States Senator. In the evening of life, Benton has made Kansas City his home. But he's traveled all over America and to Europe, achieving acclaim as a leading artist of the American regionalist movement. His paintings hang in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and many other art museums. He is best known for his murals, his poems without words, on the walls of such places as the New School for Social Research, the University of Indiana, the State Capitol of Missouri, and the Harry S. Truman Library. Both the American Institute of Architects and the Architectural League bestowed gold medals on Benton for his murals. For seven decades, Benton has roamed America, writing about and painting her people and natural treasures. Benton says, however, he's never happier or more content than when he's on a river, or simply watching its rushing water as it cascades away in summer. Years ago, before the railroad sent their prongs into every nook of the country, Benton wrote, all the rivers of the Missouri and the Mississippi were regarded as traffic ways. Then too, there was, and still is, something about flowing water that makes for easy view. Down the river was freedom from consequence. All one had to do was jump in a skiff at night and by the morrow be beyond the reach of trouble. To read Tom Benton, to see his paintings of America's rivers is to feel the presence of the mountain Indians who for thousands of years lived along the riverbanks. It is to know the immigrants from the east who filled the open land and set up their homes along America's rivers. Benton has written of these Americans and painted and drawn them, and the Americans who followed. Always he goes back to the river. His greatest reverence is retained for the rivers of the Ozarks. Such a river is to be found in northwestern Arkansas, 131 miles north of Little Rock, about five and a half hours driving time south from Kansas City or St. Louis. Here you'll find Benton's beloved Buffalo River. For 148 miles, it winds eastward through the Ozark Hills, finally finding its junction with the larger White River of northern Arkansas. By comparison, it is indeed a stream. The Ohio is six times longer than the Buffalo River, the Mississippi 16 times. The nation has recognized the importance of preserving for future generations its free flow and exceptional wilderness. In 1972, a federal law was enacted preventing the building of dams on the Buffalo River and other intrusions on its natural beauty. The current moves slowly. Sunfish and bass are at home. Towering trees like sentinels along its banks reflect in the stream below. Outcropping white bluffs break the monotony of the tree branches and foliage. Along the shoreline in the summer evenings, there is an immense quiet, an ineffable peace. River rovers rest around campfires, contentedly enjoying the out of doors. Two such river rovers, Randall Jesse and Thomas Hart Benton, are found on the banks of the buffalo, reflecting on its past and its future. Yeah, uh, even though you've uh, been over the Buffalo before, this first time you've been over the Upper River, uh, but you did know this country way back. Oh, yeah, you? I made a walking trip through here way back in 19, you understand, walked all over these hills. 
Uh-huh. I've been here other times later on sketching trips. Mm-hmm. But I never saw uh, any canoes on the river in those days. Just a few skiffs. Well, today, how do you think the country compares to uh, the way it was in 1926? Well, you know, the new roads have changed a great deal. Automobile has opened this whole country up. Yeah, of course, that, that lets more people oh, see the beauty of this country, you know. Before, only the people who lived here really knew how beautiful it was. The beauty and the charm of this river is, is kind of wild nature quality. Yeah. We, I might, it's keep that, or what remains of it, if we can. Yeah, I, I'd certainly agree with that. I think they're doing its best interest. Yeah. It may, in the long run, really be against the, uh, the future of the area. That's why I tend to want control. Yeah, both federal and state control over the exploitation of such areas as the Buffalo River Basin. We have to think, as I said before, about the children, the grandchildren. Yeah. You think the Buffalo River is something unique, then, don't you? Well, sort of unique. It's kind of an extraordinary river. It offers all the hazards, hazards of fast river adventure without any ultimate danger. There is certain untouched quality about this river, it seems to me. But, you know, you can pollute a river simply by cutting trees off the hills along it, starting erosion and turning a clear running river into a muddy one. To preserve a river, you have to preserve the land about it. It's all one feet. Well, the buffalo, thank goodness, is still a clear running river. Yep, and I hope we can persuade its people to keep it that way. Well, now, let's go on down the river. Well, all right. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've talked long enough. Let's paddle a while. The river is quiet in spots, with long, languid, peaceful pools. Pools which can change as rapidly as a summer sky. I know you got a pretty good ripple down below here. Shoal on the left and a snag in the middle. Pretty good one. The river picks up speed slowly at first, and then faster, and then all at once you're in the chute. There's a rock down here in the middle of the channel. Look out for the rock there, Bill. Well, we made it out all right. There's a river landmark known as Bathouse Cave. This has long been a favorite spot of Benton's. He's painted and sketched it and its neighbor, the Nars, many times. This Bathouse Cave. Uh, where does it get its name? I judge there must be some bats back in there. <laughs> they wouldn't call it Bathouse Cave. What's beautiful about this is the erosion at the foot of the uh, rock. And I particularly like this section of the buffalo because these uh, dramatic rocks are isolated. Uh, there are just as dramatic rocks in other places, but there's so many of them you can't single them out. This thing stands out alone like a monument. My first memory of being on our western rivers goes back to 1900, when I was 11 years old. And my father took me on a float trip on the Gasconade River in Missouri, which also is one of the few rivers in this section that runs northeast. Uh, and I have been off and on. Of course, I was away both in Europe and then living in New York many years. I lost the rivers for part of my life, but I took them up again after I came back west in 1935. And either the spring or the autumn, or sometimes both, I've been on one of our rivers out here. One of my favorite rivers in this country was the White River before the big Bull Shoals Dam turned it into a lake. That's uh, not as interesting to me as it used to be as a free-flowing river. What I like about rivers, I like to see them free-flowing, unimpeded, and as near as possible natural surroundings. 
you'll find that not only here, but on the upper Missouri River. And surprisingly, the river, Missouri River, way up in Montana, is just about as wide as it is where we live in Kansas City. This painting that uh, you've done of the Lewis and Clark expedition on the upper Missouri. I followed the trail of Lewis and Clark from uh, Omaha to the headwaters of Missouri and into Idaho. But the most beautiful rivers for making drawings and paintings are these rather smaller ones with their bluffs in Missouri and northwestern Arkansas, like this river, the Buffalo, which is one of the most beautiful in the United States. And I hope we can always uh, keep it beautiful. I know the folks along its reaches also hope this. I much. think the folks along its reaches really want to see it kept a beautiful river like that. Now, this valley where we're sitting now, this bend of the river, there's a beautiful valley in here, and it's about as peaceful a place as you could ever find. The only thing you hear here when you're sitting down is a few birds, maybe a few crows. If their fish could talk, you might hear them, but that's all. I remember one of your most famous paintings, or I guess one of the many famous ones, was cotton loading, which you did on the Mississippi, I guess, wasn't it? Yes, the flood I, pictures in the way, 30s. I was way back, 1928. The last packet book on the Mississippi, the Tennessee Bell. I saw her load cotton, stayed with her, and rode her down to New Orleans from Red River Landing in New Orleans. And uh, uh, in uh, Louisiana. The flood pictures, of course, those were in 34, weren't they? they were where the, uh, 37 was the great flood of the Ohio and Mississippi mm -hmm. in southeast Missouri. Yes, I went through all that flood. I made many drawings there. Uh, I was commissioned in that case uh, by the uh, Kansas City Star and the St. Louis Post Dispatch. I see. Well, Tom, I think this is a good spot to stop talking and invite everybody to come down and see the buffalo for themselves. I'll tell them this. When they come down here and make camp, clean it up before you go away. And so Benton and his friend Randall Jesse are off down the river again, hoping that others come to enjoy the river, not to spoil it. This river is the Buffalo, but it could be any of the many rivers this artist and author has known and loved. An artist has the grace to see and feel and portray beauty. A wise man knows it should be preserved. Such a man is Thomas Hart Benton. The late art critic Thomas Craven once wrote, Tom Benton is one of the few living artists with a first-rate mind. He has not only the ability to live and create, but to think. And a painter with the ability to think is something criticism has not had to reckon with for many a day. Benton is, like Dreiser and the novel, O'Neill and the theater, a pioneering force in American art. This has been the story of a man and a river, Thomas Hart Benton and an Ozark stream called the Buffalo. those again you can share those with your friends I personally again a, a Kansas Cityan and a lover of Benton I now know so much more about him and including I, I doubt there are many other artists who have made it into Sports Illustrated I, I think that tagline that's something to achieve um, thank you Steve for that as I mentioned before, we are lucky to live in a spot on this earth so beautiful that we have drawn not one, but two world-class artists. And I'm so glad that we can move from Thomas Hart Benton to talking about the works of Ken Smith, whose works are currently on exhibition at the Shiloh Museum of Ozark History in Springdale. Ken Smith's Buffalo River Country 
will run there as an exhibition until December 31st. We have added um, the uni University of Arkansas Chancellor's Fund grant has helped to fund that partially, small part. Um, we are pleased to have Ken in the audience today. And I am here excited to invite to the podium to speak on Ken's work, the uh, director of the Shiloh Museum, Angie Albright. Angie comes to us after a career in academia as an English professor with a new historicist focus. She moved into the nonprofit sector in 2008. Her doctoral specialty was in 1930s African American literature and culture. Her nonprofit specialties have been communications, management, and fundraising. She is an Iowa native, but has adopted Arkansas as her home and has been here for 35 years and feels deeply tied to the Ozarks. Her first job out of college was as a historian for the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program, and she's thrilled to have found her way back to preservation and public history in the last few years. Please join me in welcoming Angie to the podium. Thank you for having me today. Good morning. I'm so happy to have this opportunity to talk about Ken Smith's photography, the Buffalo River, and our Shiloh Museum exhibit, um, as Trisha said, through December of this year. It's also fun to see so many familiar faces, and it's also a little daunting that the subject of our talk today is in the audience. Steve did not have to deal with that. so. <laughs> Um, I might get some place names wrong or a few things wrong, but know that um, I'm doing it with sincerity. In 2021, we were discussing as the staff how we were going to recognize the 50th anniversary of the uh, Buffalo's national designation. We knew that many other entities would be doing the same. Our staff members, Marie Demaracos and Susan Young, who both retired right after this decision, um, came up with the idea to use the photographs that Ken Smith took while exploring the Buffalo's watershed in, 19, in the 1960s and that made up his book, Buffalo River Country, published by the Ozark Society in 1967. Dr. Neil Compton receives much well-deserved attention for his environmentalist work, and I fully recognize that I'm in Dr. Compton's home turf right here. Um, but our curators knew that seeing this moment through Ken Smith's lens would provide a unique perspective and bring attention to the decades of work that Smith has done to preserve the buffalo and the entire region of the Arkansas Ozarks. Smith grew up in Hot Springs and he graduated from the University of Arkansas with a degree in mechanical engineering. He worked as an engineer, but he wrote for the Arkansas Gazette and the Arkansas Democrat over the years as well. Some of you remember there were two separate papers at one time. He went on to work for the National Park Service as a civil engineer and a park planner. And as you will see later in the film First River, he was a founding member of the Ozark Society. In 1964, he took a six month leave from the Park Service to study the river, photograph it, and began work on what would become the seminal publication about the Buffalo River. He took hundreds of photographs using a Leica camera with a um, color slide film, and that camera's on display at our exhibit. They were all slides and our curators lifted, sifted through all of them and had the difficult task of choosing just 24. I had the difficult task of just choosing a handful out of that 24. So the ones I selected here today, frankly, they're just my favorites. Um, but I also think that they're representative of the kind of work that, that Ken did. So towards the end of his book, Buffalo River Country, uh, Smith quotes the naturalist and author Aldo Leopold, a fellow Iowan, from a Sandy County Almanac in 1949. He says, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the community of all living things. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. This appears at the end of the book, and he uses it to remind us that caring for our land matters to inspire and motivate us to keep fighting for the land. But I think it applies equally to Smith's work. He's a remarkable combination of artist, writer, scientist, and activist. This book and his work also preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the community of all living things. In the late 1960s, these photographs were seen in the context of the book and the fight to preserve the Buffalo River. 55 years later, we get to look at these photos in a different context. We can see them as works of art, 
integral to, but also separate from the book and the legislation and the map making and the exploring and the activism. First up is the old Boxley Church, also called the Walnut Grove School and Cemetery. Uh, the building was built probably 1877 in Newton County. This photograph was May 21st, 1965. One of the hallmarks of Smith's work is his documentation of the historic built environment in the watershed. We're accustomed to seeing the soaring views and the beautiful vistas, but he documented life around the river too. The this type of construction was common for the period and closely resembles the Shiloh Meeting Hall in Springdale that's on our museum grounds. The architecture here is simple and straightforward, but a building like this is a testament to the community that wanted to gather in the interiors of this type of architecture. They simply soar. If you get a chance to go into a building like this, that's where the magic is. Smith captures the cemetery here also, so there's this profound illustration of honoring the past while celebrating the living. Note the composition of this photograph, the stark white building in the right-hand corner, with the foreground dotted with headstones and a road on the left moving to who knows where. I almost said another one of my favorites. I'm just going to stop saying that. Um, this is the log cabin on John Hill Place in Isolado community in Newton County. This photograph's from May 1965. This is an excellent photo showing the common vernacular log and stone construction. Lightly, likely the cabin is late 1800s, maybe mid 1800s. This particular angle is advantageous and it's very common for architectural photography. You can see the entirety of the stone chimney. You can see the carefully notched logs on the corner. And the logs themselves are likely not old growth as they are fairly narrow. But aesthetically, this photograph is pleasing as well. The rich earth tones of the logs in the chimney contrast beautifully with the delicate blooms on the tree behind it and the lush green grass below. This photo also shows a common technique that Smith used. He often puts a human in the shot, which gives us a sense of scale. This gentleman is standing a couple of feet above the ground, standing on some sort of makeshift ladder. And it shows that this was not a hut. This is a structure that at its time had some rather lofty ambitions. This is Nervia Yancey with her rented log cabin on State Highway 74 near Highway 65 in Searcy County in February 1965. This photo calls to mind the photographs and text of Walker Evans and James Agee in their Depression era portrait of rural Southern poverty. Let us now praise famous men. Like Evans and Agee, Smith captures both the people and their home with dignity. This is not a critique of Ozark life. You can see that. It is an illustration of the many contradictions that we still live with here in the Ozarks today. We are both the home of the corporate headquarters of the world's largest retailer and the home to hard scrabble life in the hills. We are only a half century removed from the woman in this photo in my lifetime. Note that she's standing at the gate, welcoming you in. The wash tub is hanging up and the yard is free of debris. The fence could hardly be holding anything in or out, but it's trying to. And again, the composition of this photo is remarkable. The woman in the foreground, the house in the midground, and the hint of the hill rising behind them. You can see both the vulnerability and the dignity of this life. This is from Dongola, Arkansas, the post office in Searcy County in February of 1965. Okay, I'm just going to say, this is my actual favorite photo. <laughs> so, uh, from the minute we were uh, getting these framed and getting them hung, this has always been my favorite. I love how the red is so striking against the gray clapboards. The color is really uh, stunning. And this building is the heart of Dongola, if it is the post office, the purveyor of Coca-Cola, and Camel cigarettes. The caption in the book actually quotes the subject here, the woman here, who says, no, I don't carry that, but the salesman wanted to put a sign up anyway. <laughs> I wish I knew which thing she didn't carry. The Coke, the Vicks, see the Vicks over there? Uh, the Camels, the RC, 
We don't know. And again, note the composition. The highest point of the building is in the right third of the photo, but the human, the woman, is looking to the left in the opposite direction. This is Donna and Bonnie McCutcheon in Big Creek Valley, south of Mount Judy in Newton County in May of 1965. That's Sam's throne at Knob Mountain in the background. This, pro this photograph is profound. It is a surprise to find this kind of landscape in a study of a river watershed. It's a reminder of the diversity in the land around the river. And here we have two women, small in the photo on the left, facing two barns who seem to be looking back at them a sort of mirror image of these two sets of beings. And behind all of them, a rising point that overshadows them, a clear illustration of how the land dwarfs both the humans and the structures. These are, uh, this is a photo of amateur and professional archeologists pre preparing to remove a Native American burial from the Bolin Shelter in Big Creek in Newton County in February of 1965. Smith took a number of photographs that illustrate the kind of work required to study the landscape. But even in this seemingly mundane photo of people at work, with only one looking at the camera, we see the beauty of the striated cave walls making lines in the background and the circle of the people at work. Your eye is immediately drawn to the center of that circle, juxtaposed against those striations and you have to wonder what's happening in the middle. Okay, there's three people looking at the camera, not just one. <laughs> now that I look at it, and it looks different, much bigger. This is from a sink opening in Peccary Cave on Jack McCutcheon's farm in Cave Creek in Newton County in March of 1965. And again, Smith offers up a person to give us a sense of the size of the cave and the opening. The light shining through is stunning, and the man looking up seems to be drawn to that light, a uh, sense of awe. And it might simply be practical. He might have looked up at that moment, but what we have is that sense of awe with the man in the photo. He's in limbo between the light above and the slope moving towards an unknown, unknown destination below him. This is known as Peccary Cave because of the finds of numerous bones of the now extinct peccaries. And these were pig-like animals that would have been twice the size of today's peccary that you can find in the southwest. So there's um, a lot of natural history there as well. And of course, there's Hemden Hollow. This is the upper falls of Hemden Hollow in Newton County in April of 1965. It wouldn't be a discussion of the Buffalo River without a couple of these photos that are now commonplace when we see images of the buffalo even nationally. It might be the case that Hemden Hollow rivals Hawksbill, Hawksbill Crag for the most common image of the Arkansas Ozarks. Besides the gorgeous shot, note the person at the bottom of the falls. Let's see. There's uh, right there. Tiny, right? Talk about sense of scale. In the book, Smith asked the reader to look for the other boy. Does anybody see the other person right there it's remarkable isn't it but Smith's words are their beautiful companion to this photo he writes quote even now in flood it was a thing of airy grace dropping free from the top of the precipice the stream came down in a long wavering wind-blown column swinging randomly from place to place as it splashed on the stone floor I think, I'm not completely sure, that this is a view from Big Bluff overlooking the river. So a chance for us to pull back and have that larger perspective. Again, the composition here is stunning. The tree on the left and the rising mountain on the right, and a river runs through it. I had to quote Norm McLean. So. Smith closes his, books with these, with his book with these words, reminding us that if we truly love this place, then we must act in its best interest and the interest of those who come after us. Care 
If we care a great deal, we call it love. So it is love, love of land, love of people, and love for those who will come after us that should guide our actions. Let it be love. Nice. This is the cover of the uh, Ozark Society's uh, 50th anniversary commemoration of the original publication of this book, um, edited by Janet Parsh, who is here and who I have known for many years. And she is one of the Buffalo's great champions, and she was an important contributor to our exhibit at the museum. So now, 55 years later, we can study the book, the research, the words, the photos through this artistic lens while at the same time never forgetting that the work of preserving our natural heritage goes on. It, it never stops. Thank you. Thank you, um, Angie and Steve. Um, it, this has been inspiring. I, I love how we're seeing all of these different ways of viewing the buffalo. And also, for me, it, it's intriguing to see the juxtaposition of the natural and the social, that we see both these pictures of the beauty of the river, but also these looks into the people and their lives in these periods and how those come together. I have been given some, uh, I have an iPad here with questions that are coming to me from out and about. I don't know quite how they're coming to me, but I'm going to hand them over to our um, um, panelists here. Um, please turn on your mics. Um, the first question I have is about Thomas Hart Benton. Did Thomas Hart Benton visit and document any rivers while visiting Europe? Uh, no, he, he did study in Paris uh, when he was, 19, 20, 21 years old. Uh, he did some paintings of the south of France, the landscape out there. Um, unfortunately, uh, his parents' house in Neosho burned to the ground in 1917, so a lot of his early student pieces were lost. Um, so not that I know of, no, no, he really didn't. So it was definitely an Americana for mm -hmm. him. Yep. The natural was America. Yep. Interesting. Um, on Ken Smith, how many photos are on display in the exhibit? We have 24 photos of Ken Smith's on display, and then we have um, several that are from other places, but spread across a map of the watershed that show individual moments from the exploration of the watershed. But 24 printed photos on view. Can I ask, how well do those coincide with the Benton uh, the, the map of where he would have his put-on points, I'm intrigued whether he and Ken had similar spots that they liked to highlight of the river. Are there, there points that they both saw as the beautiful parts or the places to look for? I would guess that there's a lot of overlap, partly because Ken took hundreds of photographs. <laughs> and so I'm sure that there are, um, in some of those points, like Hemden Hollow, um, and certain vistas from the bluffs that I'm sure they shared those. Mm -hmm. I'd agree. Yeah, because yeah. so, again, we see similar things in the video, in the, the paintings, in the photography, these back and forth pieces, and I'm sure we'll see very similar spots here in the first river documentary as well. What were, you, were you going to add something? I was something? just gonna okay. agree. Yeah. Um, I have a question, geographical. Does the Elk River connect to the Buffalo? I hear a no in the background, just like a, the, like a ghostly no coming from a, all right. I, yeah. I hear no, okay, uh, no, all right. Um, any other questions that I might entertain? Very back. Yes, go ahead and if you'll say it out loud or. Yeah, I'll I'll, say it out loud. Yeah. The, I'm sorry, which it's river? The King's River. Did Thomas Hart Benton do any research of the King, or anything on the King's River? Not that I know of. It's, it's not a river, I'll admit, I, it's not a river I, I've heard of, so, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, the, if, yeah, so if he did, I, I'm not aware of it. And one more there, woman in the orange blouse, please. For Steve.
-hmm. Correct. I, no, it, no, so no, no, no. May, so, may I repeat for the, the yeah. at home audience? The question was about the bald knobbers and how um, Thomas Hart Benton's father prosecuted the bald knobbers, and then the musical group later was named the bald knobbers. And I believe they were also a Silver Dollar City group because yeah. Silver Dollar City has a bald knobber obsession. Um, that, Steve, do you want to explore the bald knobbers? So, uh, so the bald knobbers musical group is just named after. That from and they were from the nineteen the, the, the musical groups from the nineteen sixties, um nineteen seventies, uh, you know, Silver Dollar City. But there was back in the eighteen nineties a vigilante group um in the Ozarks uh that just called themselves the bald knobbers because that's what you call these hills that don't have any trees on the top. It's a bald knob. So the bald knobbers. So yep. Oh, I see one more. Matt? Did Benton ever have any connection to the Ozark Society? Did Benton have any connection to the Ozark Society? Um, help me out. When was the Ozark Society founded? 1962. 1962 was the foundation of the <laughs> Ozark Society. So I would be willing to bet that, yes, he did. Mm -hmm. I, I think he did. Um, I just, I just want to double check a, a fact there, so yeah. Let me stand that back to Joshua. Um, anything in special collections between Ozark Society and THB? <laughs> All right, so Joshua is going to get back to us on that. All right, and uh, yes, back in the way back. Right. Okay. So. Oh, so the Buffalo River canoeing map was from the Ozark Society. So we have a connection right there, and we have documentary evidence. I love it. <laughs> and I saw one more hand up here. Yes. I, 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 we can all give him an applause. Thank you so much. I think that is um, going to give us, we're going to go ahead and pause this part of our program. If you want to return here at 1230, we'll have a showing of the, I have a hand in the back. I've got a question. Oh, okay. I have one more question. Did Ken ever meet Thomas Hart Benton? Did Ken ever meet Thomas Hart Benton? He did. Yeah, I do. Yeah, give me one of those. When did you meet Thomas Hart Benton? Oh my goodness! When did I meet Thomas Hart Benton? Hmm. <clears throat> I know. There are just some memories not direct from from me to Benton or vice versa, but one time I did meet him and he gave me his secret handshake and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> it was different. He grabs my hand in a certain way and I think he might have learned it from some teenage kid. But uh, he, he was there at uh, Ponca, for, for example, staying at that, what is called the lodge, when it was privately owned, or I should say, it, uh, it was owned by people who uh, were friends of his. And maybe it was there that I saw him. Um, there are stories about Benton. I, I never did camp with him, but uh, a friend of mine who worked for the state of Arkansas, John Houston, H-E-U-S-T-O-N, he's passed on now 
but uh, he was on one of his Benton's, uh, Benton's float trips. And the people in, in Kansas City were really the ones who organized things on the Buffalo River and probably on the current river, other streams too, for Benton. And Benton was simply the guest and he, uh, I know that for example, he uh, was one connection. When that Buffalo River book of mine came into, into print, there was a uh, double page picture, I think it was at the very opening pages of the book. There was a group from Kansas City mainly who uh, were camped down there at the middle of Buffalo or on the way, floating into there, and I was behind them, along with them, and took a picture. And uh, it's a double page spread, I remember that. It was a uh, frontispiece and a sort of, for that book. Well, Benton, of course, obtained a copy of the Bent, and, and, and my understanding is that he found that place and they, uh, I guess they were camped right across the river there, down on the middle river. And he uh, had one of the, I guess it was a guided trip for him because he uh, used one or two of those river float guides, certainly on the Buffalo and probably there were others as well on the current river in Missouri. But that frontispiece of the book. Let's see what will they have here. There, big double page spread. And of course that was the one that picture that I took in for the book and it what we were after by the way and what I was after and all my friends who loved the Buffalo River <clears throat> was to have some emphasis on the middle reach of the Buffalo, which was threatened with a Corps of Engineers dam uh, back in the 1960s. Of course, the Corps had to back off. Corps of Engineers backed off. But there was this picture, double-page spread, and I, I, certainly the book was intended to cover not only the entire river, but at the, the watershed, because the water, river and the water yes, shed are, well, we could say intimately related. Anyhow, Tom Benton got a copy of the book and he saw that picture and then we, he, he was able to find out where it was taken and I was told by a float guide later on that Benton uh, simply uh, had that guide after they'd set up camp, of course. They, uh, he, uh, they were camped right across the river and so he simply uh, had the guide up there hold the boat in place while he was sketching for that picture of Oh, I can't remember the name that he gave it, but it was the same spot as in the double-page spread of that book. And uh, Benton was not uh, bashful about, about finding an appealing scene. I, I can't say that I was uh, given any credit or, or even <laughs> connection with that, but uh, I could tell the, tell the similarity anyhow. <laughs> Benton, by the way, of course, was looking for inspiration wherever he could find it in one or two of those other pictures in, that he painted were at places that I recognized up in Newton County toward below Pruitt there. He, he did a picture, or two, painted a picture or two of uh, the bluff on the buffalo. So, in other words, Tom Benton was part of our story and part of the credit 
for giving wide national rec recognition to the Buffalo River. And also, we should say, the float streams in Missouri, too, the so-called Ozark National Scenic Riverways that became another part of the, uh, the uh, national park system. I was part of his uh, uh, recreation ground, too. So I'm going to ask whether he ever floated the Kings River, a smaller stream that is tributary to the White. It, uh, I don't know. I think that uh, the Buffalo and probably the current river and maybe the Jack's Fork of the current were his main areas of interest, but uh, he did float other streams, white, understand. So that uh, he is our friend of the Ozarks. And let me stop. Thank you. Oh, that was, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing those stories. And now we will share the credit with you for that, that painting, even if he did not. Um, we will come back here at 1230 for our viewing of the First River documentary. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Steve and Angie.